And we're back, I think. Yes. So we probably dropped most of the people who were just interested in uh, the new features, but uh, I wanted to kind of divide this to so that I wouldn't get endless amount of people asking about to use and see new features while I'm painting. Also, I didn't anticipate uh, the zoom issues. So I think this way I can kind of switch between the viewport viewports better and it will be better viewing experience for those who want to see uh, painting. And I'm gonna start right away, but I've had this coffee here for one hour now, so... Sorry. <laughs> Okay, let's do some painting. Oh my god, what did I do? I have no idea. I just pressed a button that completely shut down my recorder, which was scary. But okay, let's paint. So, uh, I'm not gonna do that with my hair. Okay, this is this is the reason why I wear a cap. Now that I don't have a cap, I will be just like messing with my hair like some kind of a hole. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm gonna avoid that. First of all, I have a color palette for those of you who tuned into this stream. So if you want to get it, you can just screenshot it here. No, not this one. Uh, actually, I completely have made <laughs> a terrible mistake, which I'm realizing right now. So, <clears throat> if you just excuse me for one hot second, I need to uh, import it from uh, the new Procreate to the old one. Which hopefully will work. Oh my god, I'm like, this is the nature of my live streams. I am just a, a mess of a person. Do I have it here? Come on now. Okay, it seems like that worked. I'm gonna shut down the other Procreate, so that we don't get any more errors. <clears throat> Whoops. Uh, could you tell any beginner level tips for lighting? Yes, uh, there is no white light and you should never paint like your light source is white. I think that's a pretty good beginner tip. So I'm obviously not going to preserve this as the final line art, so I'm going to just uh, lower the opacity down a little bit. I'm also going to lock it so that I don't accidentally paint on the line art layer because I just hate it when that happens. It's really hard to untangle those. And the brush that I'm using is going to be the one that I'm releasing for the members of this channel this month and I am pretty sure that the name is going to be Cotton Candy and this is because I had this uh, competition that people were suggesting names for this brush and I just thought that cotton candy feels like something that I like very much for multiple reasons and it just seems right for this one. But there were so many great uh, name suggestions that I thought that like maybe I should like send the brush to multiple people who came up with like equally great ideas. This is taking way too long, so this is unacceptable speed <laughs> for painting at this stage. 
I'm just gonna do it in a smaller scale and see if this works. And then expand it. Uh, when I'm expanding, you, you never want to be in nearest neighbor. Like this is super important because uh, this way, when you expand things, they will be blurry instead of pixelated. And that's a huge difference in paintings like this, because uh, having pixelated edges, even beneath all of the finished uh, painting strokes that I'm going to be putting in later on, like those hard edges would be like incredibly difficult, almost impossible to get rid of. So when you are doing expansions, make sure that you are not doing them in a final <laughs> artwork. Uh, and when you absolutely have to, like in this case, make sure that you don't have the nearest neighbor scaling size turned on. Question from the other stream. Can you change the canvas size in Page Assistant? Um, I can find out and I can put that answer to you in the comments of this video later, but I'm not going to like guess <laughs> anything here. So I'm going to give you like a proper answer. I would assume that uh, yes, but uh, to be sure, I'm going to check and give you the answer later. So if you wanna um, copy this palette, you can do so, but I'm gonna also set it as a download for all the members this month. So if you're a member of this channel, don't bother doing it. It's going to be much easier for, for you to just download it from the downloads folder later. A Dave Twilight SMC everybody. There was like so many questions in the last stream and I've noticed that uh, often uh, people have the same questions about Procreate updates. They will all be available to everybody but usually these betas are restricted. They said to me that I uh, shouldn't talk about the beta before I get the beta version and therefore I needed to wait for that. Also in case they kind of like change their definitions of uh, the NDAs, then I wanted that video to be separate as well. So if they ask, I can delete it. You once said, Laura is saying, you once said that you wouldn't teach grayscale paintings. I personally don't like the result either, but just wanted to know why don't you recommend it? Well, if we switch to my overhead camera, if you want to see your painting in grayscale, all you have to do is like to do the um, power button trick and then you see your painting in grayscale there's like no point in painting in grayscale and just to show you some weird thing when I'm streaming and I'm projecting this screen um, to this stream what I am seeing right now is grayscale but what you see is in color but when I switch to this like overhead mode you see that what I see but I usually don't spend a lot of time painting in this mode. It's usually in the um, finishing touches or later third of the painting, or if I'm having like composition issues, that way it can be pretty easy to pinpoint. 
value problems in the painting by just checking the values. And you can paint in that black and white mode. Just gonna quickly show that. So if I switch to black and white mode. And if I color pick here and paint, for example, to the sky, if I want lighter colors to here. I am now not painting with uh, black and white colors. I am painting green on this sky. So if I was, for example, fixing a value issue here in the foreground, when I'm color picking a darker shade, I am color picking, for example, a shadow color of this uh, green grass. When I'm painting it here, I don't get like a stain looking dark patch happening here. But when I switch back to the color version, I have uh, the grass colors as a shadow color now. It's like way simpler. And if you, for example, do this uh, trick that I see a lot of people teaching on YouTube, that you make a black or white and then set that to saturation and they check their values this way. Here I can't do this because now when I'm color picking this, I am color picking a gray value. Also, this whole thing just cost me like way too much time to hassle with that. So when you have it in a one or three button presses, then you can simply switch between those modes really easily. You seem to be a little bit tired. Yes. <laughs> what else is new? It's morning here. It's my morning coffee. Uh, Levi is saying pr pretty much what I just went through. There is a trick to fill the whole layer with black, set it to color mode and put it on top. Would you recommend it? No, because it just takes too much time and you can't paint in that mode with colors. I'm sorry, but like it's just not faster and it's not as flexible. Also, you lose that whole layer from memory. So when I'm painting for print, usually I am almost at the edges of my uh, layer limit when I'm doing the final touches. So I want the absolute maximum amount of layers that I can use. And if I can just turn the whole screen of the iPad into black and white, that doesn't mean that I have to give up an extra layer at that phase to see the colors in black and white. So I just don't see any uh, added benefit of using that. I know that it's kind of like doing the same thing, but it, because of these reasons, in my opinion, I don't think it's a better way of doing it. Uh, Chanae is saying, I tried using SketchUp today and have a template for a little loft studio and I'm so excited to add details and paint it. I wanted to get into interiors, but I was intimidated by perspective. Zane, now that you have used it for the first time, can you say to everybody in the chat just how insanely easy that program is to use? And that's why I recommend it to people who are kind of not interested in becoming 3D modelers. Because sometimes when I just want to have like a reference for shadows, like for example, you have probably seen uh, that which is apartment that I am currently painting. It's a longer project than this one. I am basically sketching the location of the shadows when I'm doing that uh, SketchUp live stream that I did in 60 minutes. And 60 minutes, I know that for everybody that doesn't sound like a lot, but I have been painting that uh, interior space now for the whole week. The whole week. So in relation to how much time I have spent drawing that thing with pencils and painting it with colors, then 60 minutes in SketchUp, it's just like nothing <laughs> in comparison. And it has given me a really good start because the shadows and the shadow placement, it's really important to the mood of that piece. 
So you can achieve the same end result multiple ways, really. But I just think that uh, for what I'm doing in that piece, it's uh, by far the easiest and fastest way to figure out those sort of like perspective and light placement things that would be possible to do without SketchUp. I'm not going to deny that, but uh, it would have taken another week just to get the line art done that way. And I just, I don't have time for that. Janae is saying, it's so easy, I've never used it before and I didn't pay for it. It was perfect. Uh, the reference for the way the light falls into the interior is amazingly helpful. Yes! <laughs> See, <laughs> I'm not crazy. At least one person agrees with me. I'm not going to uh, claim that it's a better 3D program than something like Blender, for example, but that's not what it's used for. I think for drawing, it's like insanely helpful. I think we need to have some bare colors to get a better feeling for what this painting is. Maybe the bear has like a huge head. I have a massive head, so that's always the reason why I draw massive heads on everything. I'm gonna unlock this layer, select the head. Actually, this is one of those situations where I want to have a safety net or reference later. Make sure that I'm actually improving this. I'm just gonna scale down the head whole lot and I'm gonna keep it so I'm gonna get rid of this it's still a huge head but it's not like weather balloon huge I don't know if you can tell, but I am just... I, I usually don't get this excited about process, but I am just in love <laughs> with this brush. I am so happy to share this later, but yeah. It's one of those things that I don't remember the last time when I was... Probably when I did snow brush, if anybody remembers that. But this has been just, I'm so excited to show the interior painting of the witch's room because it has been done with this brush and it's just, it has that watercolor look to it. But yet it's a bit more vibrant and watercolors are, I just love it, love it so much. And I hate it that I always need to have these like disclaimers that are like, of course, brushes don't matter and you can use whatever brushes, but when you are creating one brush for the entire day and then suddenly you kind of like find the settings that kind of are so flexible, it's hard not to be excited by it. I don't think it would be beneficial if I just didn't speak about it at all.
but you don't need this brush to paint. You can use whatever brush you don't need to get it. Kind of like these like very pastel colors. Also, if anybody wants to know how to do that uh, screen black and white thing, there is uh, a video on it, and it has a title of something like "How to Check Values uh, on iPad or Procreate." I guess on, on iPad. So now it gets uh, quite easy once you just figure out like the few basic tools like push and pull and moving for me was the most difficult because for moving you need to uh, place the cursor to the kind of like edge if you want to match it with something else. But once you figure out moving and pushing and pulling then like everything else happens with those like few basic things. And then there's also this side to sketch up that is harder to describe in a review, but for me it's just using it is so much fun because it has been built on these uh, few basic principles that are super fast to learn. Like you can literally learn the most important features in the first 15 minutes when you put it up, but then the combination of those uh, different features like that's like an endless puzzle that you can figure out all kinds of complex shapes. So when you first open up SketchUp, it seems like it's a very limited program because it only has these like few basic tools for making boxes or cylinders. But then when you understand that you can kind of combine those elements to build any shape in existence, then it becomes like this uh, puzzle game that you can kind of figure out your own ways of like getting the end results and just this process of like thinking how you can kind of bend the program to your will. It's hard to explain but it's like playing a game and like it therefore it's so uh, enjoyable when you come up with those solutions on your own. And because the principles are so simple, it like always feels like you always know the limitations of the program, but uh, kind of like getting around those limitations is uh, just endlessly fun, in my opinion. I don't like acryl, acryl colors, like somebody is asking. Nami kun G. Uh, I just think acrylic colors are kind of flat. They are easier to learn than oil colors, but uh, oil colors just have this vibrancy that acrylic colors, in my opinion, 
they can't match. And even oil colors, you kind of have to use them the right way to paint them so that the paint doesn't like die on the canvas. But when you can do that, I think the end result is uh, more vibrant than like any other medium. It's kind of hard to talk about it since you don't see it on social media. If you take a picture of an oil painting that has been painted wrong so that the paint has kind of died into the canvas, it will look completely fine in a photograph and it's kind of like an amateur easy way to paint. But when you see the painting in real life, you can see that if the paint has kind of died on the canvas or not. For example, if you go to National Gallery and see any of Van Gogh paintings, you see that those are like super, super vibrant paintings. Like it looks like the paint hasn't even dried on the canvas yet. And sometimes this is just a a matter of logistics, some, uh, for example, solvents kind of make the paint seep into the canvas a bit easier, which can be uh, damaging for the look of the painting. And this is going to sound like really <laughs> terrible. And I just want to make sure that everybody understands that Monet is like one of my favorite uh, painters. I love all of his paintings and I had his paintings everywhere when I was growing up. But when I saw Monet paintings for the first time in uh, London, it was kind of a disappointment because uh, that paint hasn't been like preserved at all. It looks... Uh, like the vibrancy of the colors has died. So if you have seen, for example, Monet paintings in posters or art books, when you see them in real life, uh, the colors are much more dim and faded. And I assume that they didn't look that way when they were painted. It's just uh, they haven't uh, lasted over the years for whatever reason, like it might be something that is in the paint or maybe the canvas that he was using wasn't uh, primed in a way that would hold the paint on the other side of the canvas, but you can see it quite easily. You can probably blame Monet's assistants for that. They could have done a better job. Because I'm sure somebody that famous, and he was already really famous when he was old, he probably didn't waste his time by um, repairing his own canvases. How do you decide what color to use? I am so amazed you suddenly decide to change the hues or darkness. Um, sometimes I just go into uh, hue and saturation slider and then I just kind of like 
look through my options and that's kind of part of the color design process now. I'm like definitely rusty and have lost my like color design skills when it comes to traditional media because I am so reliant on the tools when it comes to painting colors. Like right now, if I were to start a traditional painting project that was uh, longer, I would probably use um, just a digital sketch to plan my colors first. And I have done that with some um, paintings already that I have done with traditional media that I take a photograph of it and then I just, for example, use the tint slider to see if some other color would work better in some area. Or I use my phone. I have used my phone because it has been so long since I used traditional media to do any kind of painting. Uh, I use my phone and then I take a picture of the painting and then I go into filters and then just turn that picture into black and white and that way I can see for example the values of my painting which I can't see without the colors in real life. I've seen you cut and paste house elements to create your own building in Procreate. That was awesome. Like just the line art, but that was so cool. By the way, that line art that you have seen me cut and paste, that was probably in the pink video. And that was when I did the art from Art is my real home challenge. Uh, that template that I made for the challenge. I made that in um, the free version of SketchUp. So literally everybody can do that for themselves. Also the house template is still free to use. So if you go into uh, Art is my real home challenge video, there are those templates and that's a 4K video. So if you just screenshot any part that you want, you can get like any of the views that you can use as a template and you don't have to credit, credit me in any way. But I recommend using it as a starting point. Like I used it as a starting point in every one of my paintings. I added those vertical lines to the building walls and the ceiling just so that I would have like perspective references when I did the perspective for the elements that I designed for all of those buildings. So if you look at all of the houses that I made for that challenge, like none of them look like that template. It was just a starting point for me. But I think that was such a fun challenge to do because every time when I started working on a new uh, painting for that challenge, it was always so easy to start with that uh, template because you already have something, you don't have to start from zero. And I, I didn't have like any problems with motivation when I was doing that.
uh, Sahil is saying, my friend does restoration. He said that sometimes when the canvas isn't prepared correctly, it can deteriorate the painting really quickly. Yeah, I can imagine that. By the way, I am not at all saying that I am great at making canvases. Like, for full disclosure, I am terrible at that. I think it's like a <sighs> scary dark art that is just incredibly difficult to do. And it does require like real ninja skills to do it properly. I think the hardest part about preparing a canvas, something that I was never able to do properly, is like once you have stretched your uh, canvas on the frame, and then you need to prepare it with, uh, I think it's the rabbit glue, that you need to cook in a separate uh, kettle. Um, when you spread it over that canvas, uh, my teacher told me that you need to spread it so thinly that it doesn't go through to the other side of the fabric. And she showed me how she made this like perfect brush strokes over the canvas. And then she showed the other side that it didn't get wet at all. It looked so easy, but I was never able to do that. Not even once. So... It's perfectly understandable that not everybody in the world is perfect at it, because like I certainly will never be good at that stuff. I've never been like an arts and crafts person. My sister is, she's great at that. But for me, whenever I need to kind of even package a Christmas present, it's always just like a complete, unmitigated, complete disaster in every way. <laughs> also, I hate doing it. Every Christmas, I'm always wrapping up the Christmas presents at the last possible second. Because it's just like, I hate it. <laughs> I hate it so much. I really feel like this canvas should be taller because I hate it that the main cloud doesn't have enough space and I want there to be enough space for it, so I'm just going to resize the entire canvas. I'm gonna check the resolution. Because there was so many layers that that is a bit suspicious. So I am setting this to 300. In case I ever want to make prints out of this. I'm scaling this in a warp mode because I don't want the lighter area to move that much. I think the bear should have a yellow backpack, like in that bridge painting. Probably like fit colors of this painting really well too.
sometimes it's really difficult for me to con concentrate on speaking and painting at the same time. I know that that doesn't make for <laughs> the most enjoyable live stream that uh, practice makes perfect, I guess. Practice makes better. I think that's more a realistic way to think about it. Because who's really perfect at anything? Somebody's asking about the music again. Uh, I am subscribed to three uh, different music streaming services where I make my playlists and I have them offline so that I don't use maximum amount of internet so that uh, the live stream would be more stable. So the playlists are made out of those three different services. My favorite of the services to uh, listen to, like because I need to listen to like hundreds of tracks when I make these uh, live streams. Um, but my favorite service currently to use for like that uh, testing is, I think it's called Sound Stripe, yeah, because they have the most uh, flexible licensing and. It's really easy to switch tracks when I'm running in that service because all the other ones are basically like websites that I need to have my phone open when I want to browse through different tracks. Sounds like a small thing, but when you need as much music as I do uh, for these videos, then it becomes a real issue because I don't listen to normal music that much. I have a normal music streaming service that I pay for, but the need for like finding music for YouTube purposes is like constant. So I don't have a lot of time to listen to like no normal music. So I spend a lot of my day painting, like this whole week I've been painting that witch's home. And when I'm painting, I kind of like listening to music like this. Helps me concentrate. Somebody is asking about the brushes. This brush will be available for the members um, in this month's download package, but uh, I haven't updated that yet. But it will happen in a few days. I'm pretty sure that this brush is done, but usually I want to make a few paintings first 
before I kind of declare a brush finished because I don't want to spam uh, the people who are supporting me and this channel by just <laughs> repeatedly making messages that like, hey guys, sorry, I made these few new tweaks and here's the latest, latest version of the brush that I just gave last week. I think everybody would be annoyed by that. So I usually want to make sure that the brush is done before I put it there. Anybody has seen uh, a painting without line art? This is the art blur technique. Let's put the back back in there because I think it needs to be done. This is probably not bright enough of a yellow, but because I'm not using like full saturation, I still have some like editing room for highlights and shadows. Abjer, no. uh, what are your thoughts on Procreate a 5.2 3D feature? Um, I think it's exciting. Uh, I'm not a 3D modeler, so for me there's one question that I haven't been able to look into yet, but I will. Uh, and that is uh, if the 3D models that you can paint in there, because uh, what I have so far tried, those are uh, pre-made uh, kind of like testing 3D models for that. But I don't know how those 3D models are made, but if it allows for the normal map data from, for example, a sculpted model, uh, to be visible there and react to the surface of the painting. I think that's going to be like a huge deciding factor for me going forward to know if it's something that I can use or not. Because if I can, for example, do a sculpt, there are pretty good like sculpting apps already on iPad. For example, I could sculpt a whale and then paint it in Procreate. That would be really fun. But to be honest, I'm not great at rendering settings. I think rendering in 3D, it's almost like its own art form. So uh, that's something that I still need to learn more about because then the end result, I would need to export it into Blender and do a render of an animation frames or other things. I have already done that, for example, if you have seen my little coffee shop video on this channel, in the beginning titles where it says little coffee shop in this sort of like neon sign thing that turns in perspective, that I have rendered in Blender in 3D, that animation. And some other typography also that I have done on this channel.
I would rather put the yellow. I think it fits really well here. But the bear needs a bit more saturation though. I think I can use overlay blend mode to kind of punch it up a little bit. That's a lot better. Kind of stands out a bit better. I think the idea here is that these are kind of looking like stone relics, but they are books. And the beams are kind of a, in the shape of a pencil, if you look them hard enough. I need to be careful with the layers here because there's such an easy way to kind of mix what I'm doing. Somebody's asking about the uh, violet. Is asking, that's cool. Is it going? Is it going to be free? All the Procreate uh, updates have been free so far. I don't know how they make money, honestly. <laughs> Which brush are you using? This is a uh, cotton candy that uh, I'm going to be releasing this month. And it was named by people on Instagram. I made this competition that people could suggest names for this brush. And I'm going to be sending it to a few of the good suggestions. Also all the members of the channel, of course, get it. But there were some really good suggestions from members too on that competition and I don't know <laughs> what to do with those because uh, the very first suggestion was a really great suggestion and I know that that person is already a member so they're already going to get the brush anyway so I don't know how to reward them <laughs> for this great idea. I thought that I could use some of the names that I'm not going to be using for this brush uh, for the future process because there were some that would kind of like fit the way that I like to name my process anyway. So that's why I decided that instead of just one I'm gonna give it to multiple people. You can um, Christina is asking, so in the 5.2 beta, you can't upload your own 3D models. You can. You can export it uh, any 3D model. 
into it and it will open it. I already tried it myself. Mohammed is asking, are you into NFTs? This is a complicated question. Um, NFTs, uh, I think they are a great idea. And I don't want to like talk about NFTs with people who have just this like black and white view on it because it's a complicated matter and people are discussing about it in a very kind of like uh, black and white way, which I find boring and not helpful for the future of artists. I want NFTs to work, but for NFTs to work, they have to kind of, we as artists, we need to kind of demand the platforms to do better. Because right now, most of the NFT platforms, like for example, Foundation and OpenSea, they are not environmentally friendly, eco-friendly NFTs. They are sending like very small amount of the money into offsetting the carbon footprint of uh, minting NFTs. And this uh, environmental carbon footprint problem of the NFTs, I still see it when I watch these NFT videos online. It's not a problem. Like, it's not a problem that hasn't been solved. We already, as a society, we have all the tools and technology to make it in a way that isn't is destructive for environment. There's already... Like, ways of minting NFTs that is like a thousand times less uh, consuming than the ones that these platforms are using. But they haven't switched to those models. And right now, I think the whole NFT market, it has this uh, image problem that if, for example, I was to uh, make an NFT on one of these platforms that is more environmentally responsible, People don't know that that is a thing that already exists out there. When people think of NFTs right now, like the first thing that comes to my mind is just selfish, uh, greedy people, <laughs> honestly. I think that's the image that NFTs right now have. And it's because uh, these big platforms haven't changed. So even selling on like these smaller markets right now, it's kind of a bad look. For understandable reasons. And I, I really want them to work someday, but I, I think it's going to take time and it's going to be a group effort of people Kind of demanding these platforms to do better, which they can, and we know that they can. But right now, I think, when I see, for example, people that start selling their uh, art on places like Foundation, for example, that doesn't care about these issues at all, I make judgments about those people. I make judgments about their values and it is kind of off-putting to me. If you saw me like selling uh, my art on foundation right now, I, I think it would be just a clear sign that money is more important to me than the other things in life. Also, I don't want to kind of talk myself into a corner here and I, I want to give these big platforms a chance to change. Uh, I think that's why we need more reasonable actual conversations where people have different ideas and they learn new things. I want these platforms to change 
and I will appreciate them for if they want to change because I understand that there's also cost involved in these new measures. I understand that it's an investment also for them, but uh, I hope that they do it. Like all platforms, I hope that they do it. I get emails every single week from people who want me to get into selling NFTs on these different websites and I sometimes ask them that like how eco-friendly is your service and it usually results in uh, either them not replying to me at all because this is not what they are interested in or they are telling me like some incredibly vague uh, statement that they have pre-scripted like a portion of the sales goes into offsetting the carbon footprint of these and that just it's not good enough for me like i want to know like which portion how much money and how much th does that actually do to offset the carbon footprint of the nft minting like if you can answer these uh, questions in a satisfactory way then at least we to as a like a artist and a business then we have a reasonable conversation but if you just ghost me when i ask difficult questions then that progress will never happen so if you think about in the bigger scheme of things like how does the public perception of the nft market change then like i think there's just like ways to go and it doesn't seem like there's a lot of development happening on that front right now Sorry, I went on the whole rant. I'm gonna check uh, the chat real quick. Uh, Laura is asking, any tips for blending colors without using smudge brush uh, like you do? I very rarely use smudge brush, but this brush has been designed for smudge use at the same time, and there's a very specific way in how I recommend using smudge at all. Generally, I recommend that you don't use a smudge brush ever. Which I know that doesn't sound cohesive, considering that I'm basically using it for this specific painting all the time, but uh, it's different when I'm painting clouds. Shred is asking, how well do you know Blender? Well, if I think that Blender is like 100% of features, then I know like maybe 1% of all of Blender, because there's so many sides of Blender that I haven't even touched. Recently, I've been getting into nodes, and out of how nodes you work, I think I know about 1% of those two, so maybe less than 1%. Is that painting on the wall done by you? Yes. Um, Ichigo is saying, I really like how you're coloring and I hope you make a one tutorial how to color. If you make tutorial on Patreon, I'm the first who join as a member. I've already made several tutorials on coloring for the membership of this channel. Uh, because I'm a business based in Finland, I can't legally have a Patreon, but I can have a YouTube membership and on the membership content I make at these uh, topic specific tutorials including coloring and I have made them on blending, how to choose colors and how to paint light and shadow and how to paint light and composition and I'm going to keep making those uh, videos for my members. So there's not going to be a Patreon, there's always going to be a membership. I hope that, that answers your question. Uh, 
how to prevent little dots that come from our palm. I don't think I, like, I'm not right now. I'm touching the screen. I'm gonna, so. I don't, like, get dots when I touch the screen. It only reacts when I touch it with my stylus. Uh, so, I think palm rejection should uh, delete that issue. But I have noticed sometimes, especially on really long live streams. I'm sorry, <laughs> the coffee. Uh, that when the screen gets really hot, that then the palm rejection starts getting really kind of iffy. I should be painting faster. I have painted for one hour. I think, yeah, there is some progress here. Mohamed is saying, I heard a lot of artists talking about it. If that's true, we look on large scale, it can have a huge impact on carbon footprint. Recently, I read an article about F 2.0 will be more eco-friendly, hopefully. Yeah. I think the whole inclusion of cryptocurrency is like just, just there to sell the cryptocurrency. So there's some like whole other business that has nothing to do with art and it's about selling this cryptocurrency which i think is completely superficial and unnecessary and has nothing to do uh, with the uniqueness of those uh, nfts themselves i think it's weird how these two things got mixed and i think it's kind of ruining the entire thing I have said this before in these live streams as well. Uh, you know the piece called Comedian, the banana that was taped onto a wall. That was a concept for an art piece, not the first concept for an art piece, but one of those. And it didn't consume any extra resources on the planet except one banana that uh, out of those two bananas one was eaten but another was just used for art and it was sold for i don't remember if it it was in above 10,000 euros the price of that piece and it was sold to be used in two galleries not one but two at the same time if they so choose and the art piece includes instructions on how to tape that banana to a wall so it's definitely not the first one but I, but an exam an example that most people remember they didn't need any cryptocurrency to sell that idea Also, whether or not you think the quality of that art piece is good or not, like, uh, not the point of this argument. It's that the cryptocurrency is a superficial addition to sell a cryptocurrency. I don't think it's necessary.
thanks for the person pointing out uh, Apple Pencil setting. I didn't even know that you can uh, paint with your finger in Procreate. We need more small clouds in the foreground. Thank you, Mohammed. I've never seen that chief before. <laughs> Wouldn't check if I missed any of the questions. Uh... Also, I have uh, made this uh, frequently asked questions thing that I uh, now try to remember to copy paste to all of my live streams. It is um, pretty common, for example, that people ask about like screen protectors and stuff and the process. So I try to have that information there these days. Because sometimes when I'm painting, I can just like, especially when I'm doing like design part of the painting, when I'm not uh, just filling an area with color, but I need to kind of figure out how to paint an area or what to paint in those situations for me it's really hard to uh, concentrate on speaking and painting at the same time
like this is one of those situations also where so much of the color choices are kind of based on intuition and you can't kind of like act as intuition you have to give the painting all of your attention I think that's also really important for beginners. When I was starting painting, I would kind of have these like moments of frustration when I thought that like I could just have like a relaxing, casual painting session and kind of expect something to happen at the end of it. But uh, the more I paint, the more I understand that uh, creativity kind of like wants all of your attention or a painting idea. Not just some kind of like a half there version of yourself. And the same is true I think for ideas. I think the ideas that are worth painting only come when you're like fully listening to those kind of interesting ideas happen. Most people expect a uh, kind of inspiration and painting ideas to come fully formed, but in most cases uh, inspiration is just about being interested in something and then when you start kind of unspooling that uh, angle of ideas that come to you, then you can kind of like follow it like breadcrumbs and at the end you see like oh now I have found something that I am actually excited about and then you suddenly are inspired and then the inspiration comes but it, but it often requires a lot of like work to get there And you don't have to be an artist to get those moments of inspiration. I think those happen for everybody. But the moments when you find that inspiration through seeking, I think that comes through just work and repetition. I feel like I'm just less entitled now <laughs> when I'm painting. I don't expect that I deserve good ideas when I start painting. I, I can just uh, get lucky those sometimes. Also, I'm definitely not picky about the ideas. When people contact me and then they complain that they don't have like enough ideas to paint, I think they have some ideas but they just say no to them and then over time that really do does damage your way, damage your way of like uh, coming up with new ideas because you need to have momentum to be able to continue thinking and combining new ideas to come up with something that is uh, inspiring and unique to you. But if in the middle of your own brainstorming session you say that like, no, that's not a good idea, then suddenly the ideas kind of stop coming.
by the way, if there are any like corporation office workers uh, out there uh, <laughs> who have these company wide brainstorming sessions, I think those are just like complete garbage. And I think they are the worst way to get anything creative done. Like when you actually want to like make something, I think brainstorming sessions with tons of people. They are fun and really enjoyable to do, but I don't think they are an effective way to get ideas done, especially creative ideas. You really need to have a few people who are making the thing and have enough trust for those people to make those creative things and decisions. I like these kind of vertical brush strokes that are hanging from this cloud right here. This one. I don't want to lose those because I think I haven't done that before. I think it's interesting and I want to explore that area, that idea further. Also, Mohammed, uh, welcome to the Angry Mob. We are glad to have you. Also, check out the posts because there uh, are some downloads that are time specific. So those uh, folders will close on their own after a certain period of time. Uh, I think it was in one of the previous download packages, I made this uh, round, round plus brush that I love, by the way. I think it's a really good brush for beginners. Also, for any anybody who is not a member, you can just use the round brush. I think that's a great brush. Uh, and then I gave away the easy bristles brush. Those are currently not available because that uh, folder has expired. But because one member asked for them, uh, I have decided to make an exception and I'm including them in this month's download package when it is available. So it will have at least three brushes that I think are all like pretty great. Not necessary, but fun. The brush is going to be called Cotton Candy. And this is a name idea that not only one but two people came up with uh, on this uh, Instagram competition. That I was searching for the perfect name for it. One thing that I was thinking when I, because there were so many suggestions, like honestly, I screenshotted all of them, but like there were so many good suggestions over there. And one thing that I was thinking about when I was reading through them, that like, how are you guys so uh, good at coming up with names for a brush that I have made, but yet when I click those icons in the poll and when I look at the users and their own art galleries. Why do you not name your own paintings? Honestly, like somebody answered to this in this chat. Why 
do you not name your paintings? Because clearly everybody who answered to that question is good at coming up with names. There was only one answer that I think was completely unusable. And that was moist brush. <laughs> I think that person should be ashamed of himself. But I did laugh. So I don't think it's useless. It was funny, but no. Anyway, like pretty much everybody else came up with like really cool and creative ideas, but why do you not? Then I see no reason not to name your paintings when you are so good at coming up with names. Anyway. Laura is asking, what means art? I, I guess you mean that what art means to me and what is your main goal in life? Yeah. Art for me is pretty much... Uh, that's a bit... <laughs> how much time do you have? Uh, I've also seen a, a question when somebody is asking that like, what is the purpose of art? I think everybody probably has their own answer to that question. For me, the purpose of art, it's many things. I think it can be escape. Often it's escape for me. When I was a kid, uh, I have said this in previous live streams, but I couldn't kind of go outside and just move around in places that my family was living in because it wasn't safe to for a kid my age to just go outside and wander off in middle of India for example uh, so I had to stay within a very small space usually we lived in hotels so for me art was a way to kind of to escape and see more things that were available to me in the hotel area. And I'm not complaining about this at all. I understand like I'm extremely privileged to have had that kind of a childhood. But um, I had the same kind of urge to explore like all children do. So for me, art was a way to kind of create my own worlds and explore those. But art can also give hope. When we see art, it can give us ideas of like how things could be. And I think I paint a lot of like ordinary things like trees and clouds. Uh, I think part of what I want people to see through my art is the beauty that is already existing in the real world. You might not think that your neighborhood is the most beautiful out there, but like if you can just like look up and appreciate the beauty that is there already like the, in these ordinary things, I think that can improve the quality of life. I don't know that that is like a high hope, <laughs> but it's something that I think about when I pick my subjects. And I was doing that, for example, that coffee cup painting. Definitely in that situation, I had that benefit of like seeing that there's also this sort of beauty in small things that are in my daily life that I don't take the time of my day to appreciate enough. I think the benefit of creativity can also be that it can be a stepping stone for someone else's creativity. So for example, when you see this painting and then you think that what if there was like a whale flying through the sky or through that massive cloud, it would look like this. And then when you have that idea, then you can make your own painting on it. And then you can kind of like see this cycle of creativity through different artists and I think in that sense, creativity has its kind of own purpose. I know that this sounds like very <laughs> spiritual, but uh, I really do think that 
it's a huge part of uh, the purpose of why we have art and creativity at all. Because I, I think that it doesn't just benefit painting, but it benefits science. And I think, for example, science benefits from creativity this way. And it, for that reason, I think it's really important that science funding is uh, unattached from the income that it can create because that allows science to be free and it's as important for science to be free as it is for uh, art to happen without uh, money being tied to it. Like for example this painting, I might be doing this on YouTube where I will have monetization for this later, but we are talking about like 10 euros which is like maximum that I can get out of a live stream. So money here really isn't the reason why I'm painting this painting that I'm painting, but I think that it's important for us to have paintings like these that are not paid by uh, clients, that are just uh, somebody listening to what the creativity has to offer and kind of like pass that message onward. I think it's my responsibility as an artist. I don't know what the benefit of that potentially could be, but it's not up to me to even like think about that. This is just my role in this relay process. That's one of the things that I think about. For me, art is also about storytelling and a lot of the time when I'm painting, the story is kind of like coming together as I'm painting it. I didn't think about it when I was making this sketch, for example, but then suddenly these books appeared and then I thought about the bear looking at the clouds. And now that I've had a few more minutes, this is usually a faster turnaround time than it usually takes for me to kind of like understand what my own paintings are about. But I think a part of the meaning of this painting is that these kind of concrete items like the books uh, and these uh, pencils here in the lower half of, of this piece, they are something that we see that the bear doesn't see, but the bear is looking at the clouds to kind of try to see different shapes in the clouds and understand his inner world through that way. So I think it's like the experience of looking at art and seeing it in your own way. <laughs> I know that this is probably not something that came to your mind immediately when you saw this piece, but uh, uh, I don't know. I think it's an interesting idea. Usually I didn't bother explaining like my own interpretations of art at all, but right now like, I really don't care if people agree with me, and I'm not trying to push my own way of seeing the painting. I just think that it can be sometimes helpful for people who are not used to looking at a painting and trying to read the symbolism of it. And there's no right way to read a painting, but just hearing these different explanations of how there are so many different ways to look at a painting, that can kind of help your own uh, way of seeing things. And even if it's just reading things in your own way, but just to get that ball rolling, I think it can help when you hear somebody else uh, verbalizing that. I know that on this channel I talk about a lot of like painting techniques and technical stuff, but I also wanted this to be a lot about my own art as well. So I didn't want to start doing like gear reviews or iPad reviews or art program reviews all the time because I honestly think that that is not that important. 
I don't think Procreate is the only and the real program that you should be using for painting. It's just the program that I like to use. And honestly, I really don't even care that much about what application you are using. It's just not as important about what kind of art you are making. Most of the tutorials that I make uh, for my members, they are not at all Procreate specific. I can show how something works in Procreate, but it's mostly about how you can make pictures. And once you learn that, you can learn that in any, any medium. But some things are uh, app specific. And in those instances, I try to make like um, videos that are not for my members, but are for everybody. Like for example, the few uh, quick videos that I have made, those are solving specific technical issues that I've had with the technical limitations of iPad, for example, when using uh, Photoshop or Procreate. I think art is also a really powerful way to kind of understand yourself. Like when you are an artist and you make art for a longer period of time, you understand yourself in a, a much better way. Because you might have had this experience already that you look at a painting that you have done years ago but now when you see it in your folders or on your table somewhere or when you're moving and you're moving paintings at the same time, you understand what is was happening in your life during that time. And now when you see that painting, you understand the reasons why you made that painting and what the symbolism in that painting means. It might be completely symbolism that is specific to you only as a person. I think that way art can be immensely beneficial. It's like super therapy that you don't need to pay for. I guess I should say at this point that it would be really helpful to make this area of art work for you if you name your paintings every time, like, trust me, that is really, really important. I think it also helps you make more honest paintings. Uh, Kingsman is saying, what DPI do you use? I always use at least 300 DPI for my paintings. 300 or more. Uh, because this is a live stream, I usually use lower resolutions so that I can paint faster. Even when you're not making art for yourself, but you're just a person who is like seeing art or an appreciator of art. I think art can be a way to kind of process your own emotions because you kind of like project your own way of seeing the world on that artwork. And I think in this way, it's important to know that there's no wrong way of looking at art. If you only see things that are relevant to your own life and the way that you see things, that's like a perfect way to look at art and then I think that 
piece of artwork is fulfilling its purpose when it can, can kind of help you understand yourself better. Years ago, like literally over 10 years ago, I made this kind of funny painting. <laughs> oh, like, I don't know if this is a topic that I want to talk about on live stream. But it, it was just kind of like a funny painting that a lot of people thought that was just like uh, shareable because it is kind of like a visual pun. But it's called Bunny Heaven, where there is this like, oh my god, this is uh, heavy. Um, there's this like trio of like small white bunnies, and they are looking at this massive, like epic mountain sized carrot. And the title is Bunny Heaven. And a lot of people would just say that, like, oh, this is a funny image, like lol or something. But then I got these like, private messages so much about uh, people whose pets had died and they just told me how much that painting means to them and like those were really really hard to read but uh, I think it kind of shows how important uh, art can be in a way that we didn't even anticipate I didn't mean that painting to be that thing for those people but like clearly it was a way for them to process something that is really difficult. I don't know why this is so hard for me, like probably because I have a dog now. <laughs> but yeah, if you had seen those, like they were like, I appreciate the other people for being so um, honest with me for, for somebody who is a complete stranger to them about something that is so personal. But I remember reading those that they were sometimes really hard to read. I forgot that I am working on a layer mask. <laughs> yeah. But it was not the only case. Like sometimes you have these uh, interactions with people who see the painting in a completely different way and, and kind of like show you how important a painting can be for somebody else, even if it's not for you. I think that's one of the reasons why you should always publish your paintings. Like always, because your art is not just about you. It's about like this whole community <laughs> of people. You really, you never know how important your art can be to somebody else. So if you just like decide by yourself, like uh, this is not good enough to publish, then I think that that can be a really selfish act if you think about it. And what the potential of a painting like that can be. Mohammed is asking, how do you come up with concept for a painting? Do you have a process or just pick something from the mind when in front of the canvas? Well, for this live stream, I made this like really quick sketch and the idea kind of comes as I'm sketching. Sometimes I just start painting and it, it's like looking at an um, ink blot test. So I think doing just a huge mess on canvas 
it's really fun, but it's also a really effective way of coming up with new ideas because nobody fails an ink blot test. That, like nobody, there's no way to fail at coming up with an idea that way. You will always see something. And then you just paint it. And I think in those, in, when working that way, I think it's really important to uh, not to be overly judgmental of the idea. It's kind of like impro theater that the first rule is to just say yes and what else? What else would be interesting? What would make that more interesting? And then when you have enough marks on the painting, at, after that point, this is something that people who are new to painting hate to hear. But my checklist method of painting, uh, this is something that I teach in my um, beginner to advanced series. It's very fact-based. This might sound kind of like cold, but it's very simple checklist. It's a really long checklist, like every video I make is kind of like only one point of that entire checklist. But I go through the painting, just kind of like checking like all the best practices of how to make a painting and if something is off or hasn't been addressed, that is part of that checklist then I fix it if it is a problem. But if it's not a problem, then I don't fix it. Because the, uh, one of the more complicated aspects about learning art is that all the art rules, they work in both directions. For example, one art rule that is happening here, I wanna show this in the overhead camera, so you can see uh, everything on screen or my hands, because I'm like very <laughs> handsy, uh, talking with my hands kind of a person. Um, okay, so let's go to um, crop and resize, because there we can see these uh, crop lines. I don't know if you can see them. What about now? Yeah, so there is the middle point of this uh, painting. So one of these checklist rules is that when you're doing a landscape painting, never ever, <laughs> never, have your horizon line at the center point of your painting because this painting is about looking to the sky and looking at these clouds therefore I am placing my horizon here on the lower half because there's less space for this ground because it's not important in this painting and that makes us look into the sky so this is one of those checklist items but of course as all our rules work both ways this can also be used in reverse. If you want to make a painting that is fully based on the sole fact that the horizon line is in the middle of the picture, if that is the point of the piece and is a way for you to enhance your visual impact and storytelling, in that case, that is the most important thing to focus on. And that rule is still true, but it's important to know it is it's important to know that rule before you break it so you can do so intentionally and you don't break several different rules at the same time because then you end up with a painting that is just confusing to look at. So then people can see that like, aha, this is painting is using an unique composition idea and it's there to make a point. For example, there's this uh, kind of famous photograph that I can't show because of copyright issues on this channel. But there's this uh, one famous photograph that has been taken of an iceberg and it has been cut so that the horizon line is right in the middle. So half of the image is just sea, half of the image is just sky. And then on the middle of the picture, there's an iceberg wall. So the iceberg is going to the middle of the picture and then half of the picture is just the reflection. So the whole point of this image is that there is sky, iceberg, reflection of the iceberg and water. It's just these four graphic zones. That's the whole point of the piece and if there was anything else in the piece or other ways to break the rules then it would be confusing 
for us to understand that this is the whole thing that we should be looking at. And that's the whole visual point of that uh, photograph. Okay. <laughs> Sorry for this whole rant. Okay. But those are checklist items. I know that like most people don't come here for like weird art lectures so I try to limit those but when I get excited about something then it's really hard for me to just stop. <laughs> That's the best reason to have a YouTube channel by the way because having a YouTube channel is a way for me to like talk about art without anybody kind of like shutting me up. <laughs> Like in normal social situations, somebody would be like, okay, enough about this topic already. Let's choose a menu item already or get on the bus or something. Jana is saying weird art lectures are like 89% of the reason why I'm here. <laughs> okay. Good. Good. Um. Uh, Pal was saying a nice comment. I usually I feel weird reading out really nice comments. It's 
feels awkward. It seems like I'm making compliments for myself because I'm talking here by myself. Uh, Kingsman is asking about uh, feedback. Um, I have a weird opinion about feedback, uh, especially in situations where I, I don't know the person. So, if I was your art teacher and I knew what the assignment was, then I could kind of more easily give you feedback because I knew what the assignment was and how well you have listened to the assignment and incorporated that into your artwork. But just uh, commenting on random artwork, I don't think that is helpful. And on top of that, and here's the part that is really going to annoy a lot of people on the internet, I don't give written feedback ever. And not only that, but I don't think it's helpful. Not just for me, but I don't think it's helpful for anybody in any situation, especially in uh, work environments. Yeah. So if I am giving you feedback, we are probably on a Zoom call and you can hear my voice and you can see my face and you know that I have good intentions when I'm speaking this to you and I understand that we are having a conversation and I will not be writing uh, feedback to a person. This is not a service that I will ever offer. I sometimes do, for example, uh, portfolio reviews and I have these uh, Zoom calls every now and then where I look at artwork, but uh, in, in those instances I've already had like work hours where I have put into looking at the art before I comment on it and I understand where that artist is coming from, what their experience is and so on, and what their goals are and all of that stuff. That is all work that happens before the call even happens. And that way I can give like relevant information for that person. Because otherwise I'm just speaking about paintings that I think are good looking, which is not beneficial. Because the intention is never... It, it's not about me. It's not about what kind of paintings I like and so on. have been so messy with these layers through this entire live stream. I mean, like it's a disaster. <laughs> I kind of like the way the painting is going so far, but just the layer structure is just like, oh my god. This is not how I normally paint. If you have seen uh, any of my long form processes, uh, then you know that most of the painting process happens on one layer, on two layers if there's one for line art, and all of these extra layers are used in the end for editing. But in live stream, it's just like all rules are out of the window when I'm trying to get something done as fast as possible so that I could convince you guys that I can paint somewhat. <laughs> okay. I wanna experiment with some colors for flowers on the ground. I think color variety would be something that I now have more information for right now. But if I had done this in the beginning of the painting, it would have kind of tilted off the hue variety in the sky. And for this painting, it was like way more important.
also Kingsman. If you're, I, I think you said that you're 15. Yes. Uh, know that you don't have to just like listen to feedback just to random people commenting on your art online. Um, if you're in school, you probably have art teachers. Uh, it might be hard, but uh, listen to them because they know your situation better and they have your best interest in mind. When I was 15 and I was reading comments online, I thought that like, okay, all feedback is good and I need to kind of like take everything on board, but people are really bad at that stuff. And also, it's something that I used to be very bad at myself. I think I'm better now, but when I started working, I was really bad at giving feedback. I think it's one of those skills that like we don't dare to criticize when people give us bad feedback because we are so afraid that it might seem like we are thin-skinned and not appreciating or listening or not willing to grow. But giving feedback requires the knowledge of already understanding the rules on which you are commenting on. And not only that, but it requires that you also have the experience to talk about them in a way that other people understand as well. And that's a whole another skill. And it just doesn't come with just being able to paint. If somebody's good at painting, it doesn't mean that they are a good teacher. I've had so many, many art teachers, and I can just say that like have handful of like really good ones that were able to communicate in a way that they weren't trying to push me into painting like they are and they were able to communicate kind of universal rules about art that were able to help me to communicate my ideas better in my own way. I hope you don't take it the bad, the bad way. Uh, I only mean well. I also know that feedback done in the wrong way or delivered the wrong way, it can be more harmful than it can be helpful. But that's why I think it's something that I feel really passionate about. The last time I was doing a concept art class for a game school, uh, they had this offer that they suggested that I give feedback or in text form. But like uh, I pushed back quite hard so that I could give the feedback in live sessions instead. Because I honestly thought that that was better for the students. Is there a story behind this art? Um, maybe.
often a story is just forming as I'm making the piece. Uh, when I was uh, designing the details for that witch's room, the painting that I'm still working on, I think the story kind of comes in the process of building it. Who are these characters? What are they doing? What is this space? What is it used for? When you need to come up with different objects and the location for those objects. I think that is the story and ending story can come in the process. It often does. Could you do a video on how to create process? Oh, <laughs> maybe uh, the basics. Uh, the basics are kind of uh, easy to cover, but it's it's a really uh, long topic. I've seen a few videos on YouTube about this, but like honestly, they cover only like small portion of the entire thing. But for example, when it comes to like understanding how wetness and pressure opacity work together and like you already have to have knowledge of both of those things from muscle memory to be able to develop them so if you want to learn how to make process i recommend that you just start by uh, making small tweaks to the process that you already like and don't feel that you need to understand how every single one of those uh, different tools works in the beginning because it's a it's a really long process if i were to make a video as a, like a tutorial and here's how to make process that would be very kind of clickbaity because it wouldn't be truthful you can't just watch one video and then know how to make process you have to know how each of the settings works and the best way to do that is to uh, just have a lot of like repetition over time. I mean, sure, you can understand what the settings mean, but like how they actually function in painting environment. That's that's where the actual making happens. Like for example, this brush. That's why I am so. Um, insistent on like not already sharing it even though I think this works fine but I wanted to make new paintings with it so that I can see it in action like in practice for me like making one brush it's usually at least one or three weeks of work before it's done not something that I just make in bulk and then upload But through those paintings, I sometimes notice that like here the opacity doesn't quite work well or I need to go into these settings and work with these handles all the time. If you notice, I'm not changing the size of the brush all the time because this brush has a lot of size variety depending on the angle and the pressure of the brush. So that's one of the things that I really think is successful about this because I don't need to switch opacity or pressure all the time, and that gives me more time to just focus on the painting itself. Wrong order. So I need to push the flowers up about this layer. Mm -hmm. 
uh, Samir Art is asking, how many layers are you using in painting? Well, ideally, about 100% less than <laughs> in this one. In live streams, it's completely different. Because in live stream, I just go for ooh, immediately getting like the results that I need to have as fast as possible. And when this live stream is over, there's going to be at least three hours of me just like sorting out things so that I can get a painting file that is easy to work on to polish on the details later. But for this, I usually just keep creating new layers when I need to try new things and in a live stream setting that usually happens a lot more. So as an end result all the live stream painting files are just like a complete disaster. And then this happens all the time as well. But when I have most of the elements on a single layer, it's just much more enjoyable to paint. It's more time consuming, but I, I kind of like that end result more. Yeah, my back is super stiff. <laughs> uh, have you done a video on your composition rules? There are so many. I have done a lot of videos and I will continue to do so. But uh, most of the art, art tutorials I do, like, they somehow have to do with composition. Composition is such a wild, most important, like, field of image making that it's not just, like, one thing. Like, it's... A combination of like all the factors that go into painting and out of those I have and I will continue to make tutorials. I think one of the first videos that I made which was like a bad topic to start with but I made on um, vanishing points and perspective and how to use that in storytelling and it's about composition and how uh, the number of vanishing points affects storytelling. So that's a very specific uh, technical topic, but it's also about uh, composition and it's about storytelling at the same time. I think I could have like a really quick uh, break so I can like get more coffee, more water. I have been like now talking for three hours straight. I still have like some details that I want to finish, so I'm gonna uh, quickly run off and uh, replenish my drinks and come back. But I'm gonna put the timer on, but I will be back before five minutes. So, <clears throat> sorry.
again, forgot my voice. So as I was saying, I have so many lamps burning into my face all the time that... Uh, I wanted to get a cap, otherwise I'm self-conscious about my hair. Uh, the last cat is asking, I just don't know about the size, does it matter too much for art? I assume that it's about the iPad screen size. I think that depends on like your budget. I would love to uh, use the iPad mini if I had a need to go somewhere. But obviously it would be kind of wasteful of money use to get something for that because I'm always painting here in this room because I have set up cameras and everything. Also if I was painting on an iPad mini nobody would be able to see the screen beneath my hand because it would be blocking the entire thing. I don't want to say the screen size is completely useless or like not important choice when deciding what the size of your iPad should be, but um, it's not as important as you probably think it is. Having a bigger screen, it does reduce the amount of zooming in you need to do, and then you can kind of like judge your brush strokes in comparison to what else is happening on the screen. But a lot of the time, like just having a small size of your painting when you're painting, it's fine. Laura is saying, uh, same, it's nice to have one, but it's not a necessar necessity. Especially if you're a beginner, the smaller ones will do even better. I think that there is an element of truth in that, because when you have a smaller screen, I think uh, it's easier not to get obsessed with details. And I think that is by far the most common uh, problem with somebody who is a beginner that they zoom in this much and then they start working on the painting and they haven't figured out their mood or composition yet and those are way more important so when they have the ability to kind of get distracted with this sort of like unnecessary stuff they do and it's not helpful so in a way if you let it a smaller screen can help you paint faster, but um, that also requires acknowledgement of the problem itself, so I don't know. I haven't tested this yet. I guess the only way to test it would be to have uh, tons of beginner artists starting on a bigger iPad and then some on the smaller one and see 
how fast they develop over the same amount of time. So I'm not going to have those resources to do that, but I would be interested in knowing if there are studies that do that experiment. Sahil is saying, if you did want an iPad mini, you could probably screen record on the go and use that for the content later. Yes, and maybe no. For example, in this uh, witch apartment uh, painting that I'm doing, I'm also using screen recording as part of the video. But screen recording, even on the new iPads, it's not very reliable. It's something that sometimes just breaks. You can stop painting and notice that your screen recording has gone off for whatever reason. And when you are making YouTube videos, it, it's kind of like a technical mistake that cannot afford to happen. Like I can't just wish that the screen recording will work. And this same problem has been now on all of the three iPads that I have used. It can work just fine for weeks and then suddenly it breaks. It can be that the footage fills up the storage. I don't think that's the reason because I've had this issue on all iPads when there has been enough space. Or just some process happens that shuts down the screen recording. For that reason, I can use screen recording in my videos as kind of like additional B-roll of a different way of seeing the painting. For example, in these live streams, I think it's a more accurate way uh, to represent the colors. So I, I think it's nice, but uh, at the same time, um, I can't rely on the whole video to have screen recording. So this is kind of like dumb YouTuber reason, but I've also noticed that the retention is worse when I have tons of screen recording as opposed to me showing my pencil and hand movements on it. And retention is something that you can't ignore if you make YouTube videos. Like, it's the most important thing.
when people watch like most of my video, then YouTube recommends those videos and that way I get visibility. Music just suddenly stopped. I think the screen recording feature is getting a bit better because I've had on this new iPad, the M1 chip one, some sessions that have been like over two hours of just screen recording and has worked fine. Hey Flint Bag. I'm good. How are you? Also, where have you been? I probably just over stream during a time frame that is not optimal for you. Which I'm sorry about. Can you say why I why you have a lot of layers this time? Because it's a live stream and in live stream it's just a quick bad way of getting more done in less time that will result in um, bad layer structure structure but a, a painting that is kind of closer to the intended visual impact of the painting faster. So that's my way of kind of coping with the time limit pressures of these live streams. My intention with these live streams is never to finish the entire painting during the live stream. I just want to have the visual impact there. So I think we are like almost at that point right now. I think I could stop around the three hour mark. But when you see this painting, this is the image that you're going to see. I can work on like five hours of details in this piece and polish and all of that stuff, but it's not going to change the visual impact of this piece anymore. Does that answer your question? source when putting those highlights. <laughs> it made no sense whatsoever.
uh, I'm going to use this as a selection to clean up some of the edges. I'm also going to use it for the other stone book, so that's why I made a duplication. selecting everything that is inverted and now I'm erasing these bits of moss and this piece of stone and selecting everything again into the stone layer, making sure the alpha lock is not on, and then painting the rest of the stone slab here. I'm using darker color colors here because I'm gonna put the moss over it. This is just going to help me see the value difference better when I'm making those changes on the moss layer. This part I am using the stylus so that it's almost uh, directly pointing at the screen and that allows me to do these very hard edges with the same brush that I can use for like all those blends. is answering long story short long story short life has been absolutely crazy i'm studying to be a tattoo artist and moved house so i have absolutely no time for life anymore that sounds like um, exciting times though do tattoo artists use that material that is like fake skin or do you just tattoo like bananas or some like animal skin when you practice because i assume that you don't just like get random people off the street and say then like hey i'm practicing to be a tattoo artist let me kind of stab you with permanent ink for life <laughs> to get better i'm assuming that's not how it works
I know I'm mixing layers, but things have to get done. So. Uh, Puyo is saying that they're painting too, and I think that's super cool. What themes are you making? Mine is a piece about the ocean. That sounds cool. I always love painting uh, waves. For some reason it's very relaxing. I think painting waves is like painting hair or painting clouds that nobody can really come and say that like you're doing it completely wrong because it, it's one of those subjects where you can completely go crazy with your own style in how you see those subjects and trees. I struggle with architecture, so I am out of my comfort zone. Buffy is saying, Wayne is saying, I'm drawing a bulldozer. <laughs> that sounds like a fun idea. Uh, Flinkback is uh, replying, it's, it's really exciting. And yes, I have been using Take skin. Yeah, that's a weird material. I got my hands on it uh, once because my boyfriend is a doctor and he was practicing like uh, poking people with needles. In South Africa, we have people who are ready to take the chance on new artists, like. The Will Apprentice, I don't know what that is. And then the Will tattoo their teacher and then bring in their own canvases, also known as people. <laughs> yeah. That sounds like people are like this marketing material or trading material in this uh, process of an apprentice's tattoo each other. Oh. Yeah, I feel the exact same way as Buffy does, like, I can't imagine the stress of... For me, drawing is hard enough as it is, if I had to imagine that like this is a thing that is going to be on a person for the rest of time and I have to be the one making it. Like I'm fine like designing a tattoo as a drawing, but like I don't want to be responsible for the execution of that idea. Also, I understand that uh, tattoo artists understand the rules of how that ink works better. So I think if you ever like order some other artist that is not the tattoo artist to design a tattoo for you. Um, 
please go also consult your tattoo artist because you can do all kinds of lines as a tattoo so the tattoo artist can kind of like change that drawing in a way that will work as a tattoo so that it won't look like a complete mess and trust your tattoo artist in that process and allow them to make changes to the design because it will look better on your body and for the rest of time so more minutes. What should I do? I like just a definition that needs to happen everywhere, but like what would give the most visual impact at this point? I'm just trying to be as fast as possible because I'm more aware of the time limit. Um, are you going to beta the new Procreate? Yes, see my previous live stream for that stuff. What I say, just want to thank you for sharing your creative work with us. It's so kind of you. It's my pleasure. Uh, we are saying also trying to get better at architecture and perspective. I took a photo of one of my favorite buildings and used it to get some nice perspective lines and painting a little bookshop on top. Ah, that's a really creative way to also use reference and also to have your own spin on it, which I think is really important. Both of those elements, like always have reference and always uh, use your design skills when making the image so that you're not just recreating an image. I've also drawn my favorite buildings and I thought that was really fun because that gave me a chance to kind of spend more time with the buildings that I like looking at. Uh, 
it's really daunting, but I feel like I've gotten used to the machine and I am confident I can learn how to get how to be a great tattoo artist. That's awesome. I'm like really excited for you. Can I ask what size you usually recommend learning Procreate? Uh, depends on if you're working for print. If you're working for print, you can actually go into the canvas settings and set uh, the canvas size to centimeters. And then you can like physically decide on like what size of a print you want to get out of it. And always use uh, at least 300 or above. This is a 300 dpi size of a canvas. How about a red backpack? Um, after a careful consideration that took me all of two seconds, I'm gonna say no, it's yellow. I don't know why, but it feels right for this. Whoa, I almost deleted my brush. It was so close. Oh, I need to make a copy of it. Did you see that? Oh my god. This is not good. Uh, just a few minutes. Okay, there's a few things that I really, really want to try. I'm gonna try it. I don't know if this is gonna work, but... Um... I want to add some like, blotches of light here. maybe also shadows. I think for this I can try and see if I can kind of bump that up with liquify. Where is liquify? Come on. Effects. Here. Bump up the brush size and just curve this up a little bit. expand the rest. And squeeze those in the corner. Okay. 
I think it kind of gives this impression of like the environment being like way more 3D without any additional detail. Do we have time for one more overlay layer? Probably not. I'm gonna do it anyway. I'm already over three hours. Damn it. Okay. Just is one more thing. Okay. I think that helps. 
when it comes to composition, I think there is still... Uh, I'm gonna show this in over... Oh, camera has died. Uh, it's because I have shut off this whole empire thing. Sorry, sorry. <clears throat> so, uh, there's this uh, one area and it's causing this kind of like scissor-like structure. I don't want these to be the same size in mass, so this is something that I'm going to fix in uh, editing phase. Not editing phase, but like in polishing. I need more mass here to fix this issue. So that's probably going to be the biggest change to this painting when it comes to composition. You can also flip your canvas horizontally, but I noticed that like when I just like turn the entire painting upside down, it kind of helps me see the painting in an abstract way on top of seeing the composition mistakes. I already fixed most of it. Yeah. But that kind of stuff. Also, um, lighter decks of light here. And then, tons and tons of flowers. Where are my flowers? And then foreground elements. I know I should have like stopped <laughs> like minutes ago. But just, just a few more things. This is when I'm like getting obsessed. And here I'm going to tell the people that this is indeed grass, not just some like green blobs. And then that's the painting. Vivi is the name of my dog. There's uh, one angry, angry mob member that is called Phoebe, though, so say hi to her when she appears. Um, hmm. How do I make the screen gray? Look for that uh, video tutorial on how to che check values that I have made. It's ages ago, 
again. But it has a house in the thumbnail and it has a red circle over the power button and a picture of an iPad screen. There's a full tutorial. It only takes two minutes to set it up and then you can switch to black and white. Okay, uh, thank you everybody for joining. Uh, even you, Flinkbat, try to get some sleep even though you have that school schedule. And thank you for everybody who has joined both of these like really long live streams. And I'm gonna go and join my running class that is going to start soon. And I'll see you guys in the next video. That is going to be probably the witch's house soon, I hope. There's still ways to go. You can also see live streams of that process uh, on my membership. Okay, I'll see you guys um, later. Bye.